There are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can absolutely light up your funnels. Let's go. This is the Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your host, Chris Mechanic. Join me as I uncover the secrets of the world's most elite CMOs marketing leaders. The Revenue Driven CMO is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. I am Chris Mechanic, and we have an awesome episode here for you today. Uh, I am really actually excited to speak with this guest because it's somebody that I know in real life and I have known uh, for some time. She's a real visionary and she's a motivational leader. She won uh, 2022 Washington Business Journal, Women Who Mean Business. Uh, she was a 2022 uh, Bronze Stevie winner also for Marketing Executive of the Year. Three-time star CMO at DCA Live. She is a founding member of Chief, which is a private uh, membership network for senior executive women. And currently wears three hats, uh, Senior Vice President, CMO, and GM of Community at Fiscal Note, uh, which is a really hot uh, DC area based, uh, now publicly traded uh, SaaS company. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Miss Crystal Putman Garcia to the show. How are you, Crystal? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. Yeah, I am super duper excited to speak with you. Where are you? Are you in D.C.? I'm outside of D.C. Um, in the Potomac, Maryland area. So just just outside of the city. Awesome. Very cool. Well, you know, we like to lead with the value. We like to go straight to the heart of the matter. Share with everybody, what is one of your best kept secrets to marketing success? So I knew you were going to ask this question. So I, yeah. um, I thought about it a little bit. I thought about this question around kind of superpowers and kind of what is my superpower. And as I reflected on the question a bit, um, one thing that people have said to me is you've worked in a lot of industries, Crystal. Um, a lot of marketers will tend to stay B2B, B2C. They'll stay in an industry. I've done biotech. I've done ed tech. I've done regular tech, now policy tech. Um, and I think that I have a, an ability um, and a gift to really be like a shapeshifter. Um, at the end of the day. And so what I've always said is that I love the marketing function. And what do I love about the marketing function? It's a couple of different things. It's human psychology and understanding how people work. I really love people. I'm a yellow. I'm in strong E. And so I love not only just getting to know people, but understanding what makes them tick. So as a marketer, I get to know the person. But the other um, interesting part about it is I'm, I'm huge into games. I'm not necessarily a gaming console person, but I love any games. I do crossword puzzles, Sudokus every day. I love logic games. Mm -hmm. And for marketing, for me, it's how do you win the game? And so yeah. it's understanding how to unpack the customer, um, but then also understanding if I know those things, then how do I win the game? And since I'm a competitive person, I get to bring both of those things together. And so across time, that's exactly what I've done, whether being at a startup in San Francisco or being at Discovery Education, or now Fiscal Note, for me, it's about winning the game and really getting to understand how these amazing products and services can benefit other people. Yeah, I love that. You know, And some people take marketing so seriously, but if you think of it as a game, which it very much is, uh, then you know, there's different levers that you pull. There's different you know, whatever you call it. Like if you were playing a console game, there's you know powers or weapons and you get to choose which ones to use. You get to see, you would like collect or save and conserve others. Uh, so I really like that metaphor. How, how is it that you can shift so easily between industries? Because most marketers, not only will they stick in B2B or B2C, but they'll be like, you know, I'm in B2C financial services and they'll spend, mm -hmm. for instance, their whole career there. Um, were you forced to shift around? Was that, did that come naturally to you or? I, um, I get bored easily. I, it's part uh, yeah. of kind of my nature. I, 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 I like to do a lot of different things. And that's kind of, I mentioned earlier when you win the game, um, there are a lot of different levers you can pull and that's what keeps me really interested in marketing. What I always really enjoyed was, um, getting to learn different industries. So I did a brief consulting, um, stint, um, after college. And I really enjoyed being able to go into an organization and then understand kind of the needs 
to kind of do the project and then move on. What I didn't like about it is that you moved on. You didn't get to forge those kind of long-term relationships. Yeah. Um, but for me, I, I've really enjoyed um, really learning new industries and and getting to have opportunities to um, to try different things. I've also been impacted. I've graduated during two recessions. And so during a recession, you have to say to yourself, what are the industries hiring and what are the ones that are growing? So for example, 2009, I graduated from business school at Michigan and there were, there were two booming industries, education and healthcare. And I tried uh, briefly at, Am, at Amgen, I did an internship, really liked it, but I realized that marketing there was very limited Yeah. and kind of growing up in the Bay Area, it really didn't move enough, move as quickly as I wanted to. And then ed tech was emerging. And I thought that's a really interesting way to combine my interest in technology. And then in an industry that's not only growing, but I also really love the idea of impacting, you know, children and learning and development. And so it was a way for me to bring my passions together. So I spent seven years in ed tech um, there and then kind of moved on from there. But I've always been kind of an open to learning new things. And I also had an experience where um, after college um, and I did the consulting stint, um, I decided I'm just going to move to San Francisco. I want to I want to be in technology and I just got to move out there. So I quit my job. I had like $2,000. I took a break. I went to Tahoe, worked in a snowboard shop and just really kind of collected myself, said, what do I want to do? So I ended up moving to San Francisco and then I ended up getting a job in privacy at um, this nonprofit that became for profit. There was essentially like the good housekeeping seal of privacy. And I never thought of myself as a privacy person, but I've always been very open to doing things. And it's been one of, it was one of the most transformative um, uh, careers that I've ever had. And it actually propelled my career into technology because it, I wasn't necessarily interested in it. But because I had an openness to learn and to try something new, I ended up just falling in love with this industry. And even today, I carry privacy principles, which I feel very strongly about, into my marketing because I understand, again, the consumer. What does the consumer want? What would I want as a consumer? What experience would I want to have? Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. So uh, I don't know if you know this or not. Actually, I'm sure you do probably. But the CMO of all the C-suite positions is the shortest of 10 years. You know, like the average tenure, I think, is three years versus the CFO is like eight. Um, and I think that's partially because it's a very difficult job. Like CMOs are expected to know everything about tech, to know everything about branding, to know everything about performance and really everything in between. Uh, but I know that because of that short tenure, a lot of the listeners here today are probably in a scenario where they're at a new company. It, it may or may not be in a new industry, but it could be very well in a totally different industry. But do you have a playbook in your mind for like when you're entering a new company or entering a new industry, like how to really learn it and assimilate it rapidly? I um, it's a really good question. So um, I do in my mind, and my first, the first thing that I do is I try to understand the company objectives because I see a lot of marketers when they go into an organization, hey, I'm really good at branding or I'm really good at demand gen, but that's not what your CEO is looking for from a leader. And um, there's a really brilliant um, kind of marketing leader named Thomas Barta. I don't know if you've followed any of his um, work, but he just came out with um, kind of a latest study kind of looking at, you know, what do CEOs think are when, when the CMO is effective, you know, what are the, what are the traits? And only 15% of the time it's technical skills. 55% of the time it's does that lead leader really know how to work the organization? Do they know how to create influence? Are they aligned to the corporate objectives? And I think I've always done that in my organizations. I come in and I, and I understand the company objectives. And then my job is to make sure that my marketing strategy not only aligns with the company objectives, but the customer need, because I am the bridge, again, the psychi that psychology part, I'm the bridge of making sure that those two things align together. And if I'm not making sure that the entire end-to-end -end experience conveys that, then we're going to lose in the marketplace. And so I, I look at my job as a CMO is bringing those things together. I hire the smartest people I can find. I'm not going to pretend to know all the technology. I'm not going to pretend to know all the things. I can't. No CMO can possibly learn that. So you have to hire the best people. And then you set the vision and you make sure you're aligned with your, your across the organization. And then if you're doing that right, it all comes together. But I just, I find a lot of CMOs lean on their technical skills. And I think that's why you have to build your team effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's actually really good advice. So, um, Understanding the org objectives, uh, 
well, all orgs want to grow, right? Mm-hmm. And I could imagine a lot of CEOs probably being like, our objective is to grow. You know, like we need more customers. We need bigger customers. We need better customers. What types of questions uh, do you use like to understand sort of the underlying, like the deeper level objectives in an org? Yeah. So I think um, it's a really good question. I think the first thing that I always like to understand in a company is what are the current problems? And so I think this has been an area, you know, you see GTM is this hot term now, like how do you lead GTM? And you start with any go-to-market plan as a leader by saying, well, what are our current problems? What if if um, there's this one exercise, I believe GTM Advisors has it, you know, what value are you going to die in? Um, essentially, um, is it, you know, what was it? it? What? Where are you? What going? valley are you oh, going to valley? die? Like what? Like what place are you going to die? Is it that you're, um, you know, you can create but you can't market. You can market but you can't sell. And so I've done this activity a bunch of different times, and what I found is that your leadership often isn't even aligned on what your problem is. And so you have these disparate strategies and resources being applied differently. And so of course you're not going to see um, see the wins if you're all focused on different things. So I think the first question you ask is, what problem are we trying to solve? Like, what, what goal? Once you get go from there, then you need to understand, you know, what is your ICP? Who is your ideal customer profile? Um, what, 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 is, what are the products that you're t- trying to sell? And then I think the key, and this is where a lot of companies fail, is focus. Like, we're all in a really tight economic climate right now. And so you're going to have to make bets. You're going to have to figure out where you're going to place your resources. Yeah. And you're going to have to align your leadership team with those decisions. And that's a problem I just see across the board is that you're, people are not aligned in those resource decisions. So if you're not aligned on the problem, you have different strategies, and then you're putting money and resources in different places, it's, you're wasting money. And so if, if you can bring those together as a marketing leader, as a go-to-market leader, I think you're going to create a lot of value in your organization. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing, mm-hmm. isn't it? Really is, to, is that focus. Mm-hmm. Because like we are in the scenario ourselves where it's just an abundance of opportunity, you know? Absolutely. Like our addressable market is huge and it's really difficult even to just like zoom in on one ICP. Like those conversations are usually like, oh yeah, well, we're really good with this type of customer. And it's like, well, can we also do this one too? <laughs> exactly. But that yeah. literally doubles the the investment, right? And mm-hmm. the amount of effort and the amount of content that you need and the amount of ads and all these things, events, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's something so, we experience a lot at Fiscal Note, which I know we'll talk about that a little bit, but we acquired um, 12 companies in 18 months. Wow. And so um, before we went public. And so, you know, a, a challenge we've had as an organization is just, you know, we have all these, you know, disparate companies. How do we bring them together, right, to deliver the most value for our customers? We've added a, a ton of personas. And so to your point, who, like, who should we be going after? We have these limited people, these limited dollars. What's the, what's the most efficient way um, that we can service them knowing that, you know, in, in, in your case, you can go, you have a, a, a huge market. In our case, we have huge market, a lot of different products, a lot of different personas. And so how do we maximize our resources to reach them? Yeah, that's a really tough one. And I do want to talk about fiscal note mm-hmm. uh, here in just a second. Sure. But one thing that you said that jumped out at me, which I want to commend you for, is like in your basically like in in the single sentence of what what it means to you to be CMO, you mentioned aligning that with the customer's needs. Like I think a lot of CMOs are not quite there yet. Like they're basically really think like they're really focused on demand, on leads, on maybe on deals and sales, you know, most CMOs, uh, especially the ones on this podcast are, uh, revenue driven in that way, but they don't naturally say like, I'm an advocate for the customer, like in that first sentence, um, has that always been your MO or like, how did that become so ingrained in you, the advocate for the customer? I think, um, if you, if you aren't taking a position as your customer and thinking about the experience as your customer, then you're not doing your job. And so one thing like I've had my demand and team do in the past is um, before you send an email, send it to your personal account, go through the experience of opening the email and, and reacting to the experience. Even just, you know, people say, no, 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 I looked at it in Marketo. No, no, I want you to send it to yourself. I want you to open it. I want you to have that experience. 
And it changes a lot about the way that you market. And so I think it's something that's always innately been in me. Again, how do you win the game? How do you, how do you, and then if you care about people and you care about their privacy and you care about their experience, but you want to win the game, you can, I think you can put those things together. And so like privacy, right? Double opt-in, right? Right. Or opt-in. You've got to think about what experience would you want? Do you want someone selling your information to all their partners? Uh, Probably not. So why, why wouldn't you embody that? And then customers and consumers are smart. They know what's happening, right? They're, and they're going to do business with the most trustworthy companies. They're going to trust companies that are going to, they're going to do right by them, right? Um, and you see that time and time again. So I work for PBS, one of the most trusted organizations. We were very clear about how we, how we thought about our consumers, how we thought about our, our viewers. Um, that was front and center. I've never been able to work for a company that I didn't believe in their values. And I really didn't believe that the products and services were going to positively impact lives. So that is a throughput that you can see in my career, whether it's biotech, privacy. I do believe that all these things benefit the end user. So to summarize, it's the marketing shapeshifter, right? Mm -hmm. Marketing as a game where there's levers, just Mm -hmm. like any other game. Uh, And I think thinking of it in a lighthearted way, well, that's a powerful metaphor any anytime, but it also adds like a little bit of lightheartedness to it, which I enjoyed. Um, and then, and then as that marketing shapeshifter, if, if you are sort of conceptualizing the whole thing, like a game, then it's easy to, to switch to different industries or to different types of companies. Um, because it's not so daunting, you know, it's more Mm -hmm. like, Oh, like, let me figure this out. Just like I would figure out my Sudoku or, Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really awesome. I like that, Crystal. You are a badass for sure. Oh, well, I kind of approach, I think, all kind of all of my jobs. So I, as you mentioned, I have a couple of different roles. So I um, I had a, a great mentor. So that's something that I always recommend people look for in any leadership role. Is, do you have someone who wants to bring you up the hill with them? And when I started, my um, my boss at the time, Dave Curran, he was just brilliant. He said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I think I eventually want to be a CEO. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Like, who knows where our paths are going to take us? And then he ended up saying, "Do you want to be a GM?" And I said, "Okay, sure. Like, I'll try. I'll try anything, right?" And yeah. um, and I approached it the same way. I've never really owned the full end to end part, but I looked in the same way. How do I win the game? If you have your principles of caring about the customer, I also deeply care about my team. Um, retention is something I take very seriously. So if you care about the people. The customers you care about the employees you care about your colleagues and you you want to win the game and if you just keep those principles in mind i think you can do any job i don't think it just has to apply to marketing i think it can apply to anything that you do if you just look at it and i think a little bit of a different light yeah you know um there's a saying that uh when you change the way you look at things the things that you look at change okay. um and I thought that that was kind of like, you know, woo woo, new age talk at first. But I came upon this book called The Secret Life of Water. Have oh. you ever heard of that book? I don't think so, but I want to read it now. So it's this book, uh, which a group of scientists basically did these experiments where they took uh, basically like mason jars filled with water and they labeled them with different words. Like one of them would say like, bliss and it was just like physical you know piece of paper that with the word bliss and then one would say despair you know like these different words on different sides of the equation they then froze these jars and they looked at the molecular structure of the water under microscopes and the ones with positive emotions like looked beautiful like like Mm. snowflakes right um but the ones with negative emotions looked like you know, like spiky, sort of icicly, kind of, um, you know, non-symmetrical. It was crazy. Wow. I've never heard of that. Yeah, you should check it out, The Secret Life of Water. But ever since I saw that, I was like, okay, you know, anytime I'm having a bad day or experiencing something bad, I'm like, how can I re, you know, reframe this or reshift it or look at it in a different way? I love that. I think that, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard as a leader though, right? Because you know, you're going to have bad days and you're allowed to have bad days. And so I sometimes I'll tell my team, like, I was cranky today. I need a timeout. And yeah. I think part of being a leader is is saying, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm going to have a bad day. 
Um, I'm, I'm, but you know, I'm going to give myself a timeout. Sometimes I'm like, I don't, I just can't talk about this today. I just, I need a break. I think having that, um, humility as a leader is really important because it gives your team permission to not be perfect as well. Yeah. And so then they're going to be more comfortable talking to you about things, ideating things, but you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to have that perspective when, you know, you've got a lot of stress. Um, we all have a lot of stress, a lot of, a lot of challenges, but I do think the more you can kind of, you know, we're not curing cancer, you know, we're yeah. driving MQLs or ABM, whatever you're doing today, um, you can figure it out. Like you're a smart person. Um, it's just, how do you win the game? Are you, are you, are you turning the right levers? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a good seg. Um, let's talk about the game of fiscal note. Yeah. And you've been there for some time. I think you've been there probably six or seven years at this point. Um, almost five years at this point. Almost five. Yeah. Um, and so for those that don't know, fiscal note is a big deal. Uh, we're in the D.C. area right now, mm -hmm. and especially in D.C., it's a very big deal. Like you guys get a lot of props and a lot of love and uh, have a lot of credibility like at you know, basically anywhere you go. Um, but, and I've known you for some time. I still don't understand exactly yes. what it is that you guys do. My understand or the, the best way I heard it described one time was like, say that you are Uber, right. And you're operating in 98 different geographies and there's small ordinances and different laws and, and things across, and they change quickly, especially if you're Uber. And so uh, Fiscal Note essentially has the tools, the insights, the resources to help compliance officers to manage all of those changes and, and be aware of them and respond. Is that, did I do that justice? or you did, you did a close job, yeah. So we are, and, and I mentioned we've grown quite a bit. We, we started out as a Palatee Tech company. Today, what we kind of label ourselves as is um, um, global policy and market intelligence. Um, and so what essentially we're doing is we're helping companies better manage corporate, political, and regulatory environments. And if you think about that, companies really haven't prioritized um, in how they are bringing these, these functions to the table. But we know that our world is so chaotic and uncertain. And to your point, think about all the ramifications, right? If there's a change in some you know, local law, international law, if you want to enter a new co country, for example, if you're doing business in a, in a country, if you don't understand what's happening on the ground in that country, um, the geopolitical impacts, the political impacts, uh, regulation that might come on the board, that has serious risk to your business, right? Yeah. Um, financial, economic, operational, et cetera. And more importantly than ever, you need to be able to ha not only have that information, right? So there's just the surfacing of it. We've taken a lot of public information and we've made it available. Um, but then we put these tools and content around it to help companies then be able to take action. Um, and so um, you know, risk officers, definitely we sell to um, um, government affairs. Um, if you think about that, um, advocacy professionals as well. Um, we have communities for several um, lines of business. But at the end of the day, if you think about this idea of risk, we generally have a solution um, that's going to help your organization. What I have found really interesting is just how risk has evolved in organizations. So if you think about COVID, you know, state regulation or, or state um, uh, policy wasn't really a thing. And then think about when all these offices shot down and like all the state implications, right? Right. Um, tools like fiscal note could be used to, to, to monitor those things, right? And so what you've also found nowadays in organizations is that companies have to take a social stand these days. So a lot of consumers expect companies to have a policy. But you, as a company, you've got a lot of different interests in your organization. So you're going to have government affairs, you're going to have corporate affairs, you're going to have a social media team, um, you're going to have PR. If you all are saying different things, your consumer is going to be very, very confused. And so having yeah. a tool like Fiscal Note that can surface the issues and help you figure out how are you going to take action and then how are you going to align in terms of your kind of how you're, what you're going to do, what's going to be your action plan, how are you going to talk about it? Yeah. Um, we, had, um, we have an, a Thought Leadership Institute um, at Fiscal Note. And we had um, uh, this, this uh, head of government affairs from a car manufacturing company say, you know, we have this internal group now that meets among that group of people I mentioned earlier, um, corporate affairs, PR, social, marketing, et cetera, because the, the marketing team was saying, you know, talking about all this eco-friendly, 
um, ESG things that they were doing. But then politically, um, some of their um, policymakers in the state were like, are you now becoming you know, a different type of company? And the answer right. was no. And you know, ESG has become politicized, um, which is its own conversation. Right. But you've got to be aligned on how you're talking about it and what your messages are to each of your stakeholders. So whether it's trying to squash a bill, trying to promote a bill, trying to get on the same page of what's happening in this chaotic and uncertain world, you, companies need a tool like Fiscal Note to bring all that together. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So as you, as you think about your time at uh, Fiscal Note so far, what are some of the things that you're most proud of or what are some of the biggest wins that, that you sort of notched in your belt? Well, I've pretty much built our marketing team from scratch, which has been really fun. I have, um, I've, I've lost maybe like three people. I mean, we have a really awesome team. It's like a family. Um, we've done, you know, we've grown the team both organically and through acquisitions. So, um, and so I'm really proud of not only the team that we've created, I think it's the best team I've ever worked with. I trust everyone on the team, A+. Plus. Um, but also the acquisitions, we've been able to build a culture that when, even when people come into it, they want to stay in. And that's not usual, um, yeah. with acquisitions, people come say, oh, there's not a place for me here. We're going to leave. So I find, again, going back, I find a lot of value in people and kind of that human connection, taking care of the team. Um, so I'm really proud of the team that I've built and the retention across the team. I think another thing is just, I've been able to be GM across a couple of different business lines now. And so um, the wins for me of watching both of those business lines grow and, um, and just kind of seeing very similar wins, you know, across the people, the customers, I love getting out there and hearing from our customers, what, what these products mean to them. I love hearing from the employees, you know, why, why they're happy to be here. We have one SDR, um, for, for the, the, the business that I run who um, sent us a picture a few months ago and said, I never thought this would be my dream, but um, because I've been at Fiscal Note, I've been able to buy my house, buy this house for my family um, and give my daughter this amazing life. And so it's those those moments that you realize that you've built something um, that really impacts people in a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's awesome. So let me ask a question that I know is on everybody's mind. Uh, how can you be CMO and GM of two different business lines like isn't that um aren't those kind of like three different full-time jobs <laughs> um they are um i think it, it goes back to you have to build a great team and so you know there, people ask me questions like do i believe in fractional cmos um i have a perspective on that which i can share at some point but i think if you build a strong leadership team under you um, you can do it because essentially what i'm doing is i'm setting a vision and i'm uh, you know i'm unblocking any challenges for the team. They're the real stars in all this. I'm just allowing them to do their job. I know that's a very trite saying, but that's that's essentially what you do as a leader. So I think across time, I've built a dynamic leadership team across marketing um, that I trust to do, to do the job. And then the same thing across my business line is I have a fantastic leadership team who I trust. And um, if I, I think if I didn't have that strong leadership team, I don't think I could wear two different hats. But yeah. because I've been able to build that over time, I, 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 I love doing both jobs. And how, how is your time allocated? Is it like even across the board, 33, 33s, or is it like 50% CMO and then 25, 25? I think it just depends on the day. Um, you know, some days, you know, we have people out on parental leave. Um, this has been a big year for babies across both my teams. So it kind of depends on where I'm needed in the business, where we are during um, the business cycle, but at the end of the day, it's, um, it's probably about 50, 50, if I really think about it, but just like any marketing job, someday you'll spend more time focusing on, you know, people, some days you'll focus more on the demand gen plan. It really depends on where we are. Yeah. Some days you're just running around, putting out yes. fires with your. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But yeah, yeah, I think if you, if you just build that team under you, um, and you set the vision, they're going to then set their strategies and visions to support you. And then your job is oversight, making sure you have the right vision and making sure that they're happy. Like a lot of my time is spent, like I do a lot of pulse checks. How are you doing? I want to check in with you. How are you feeling? If people aren't bringing their, you know, their full selves to work and feeling good across the board, they're not going to be effective in their jobs. And so you really want to make sure you understand where that person is. Oh, wait, well, you're having a bad week. I'm not going to drop this on you now. I'm going to hold it. 
and manage it a little bit differently. So I think that's just part of being a good manager. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, what are your, so I know you're into GTM or you, um, you know, GTM partners, um, and Judd and Sangram, mm -hmm. uh, who are awesome guys. And part of their model is basically like, Hey, how do you go to market? Like, are you event driven? Are you, are you sales driven? Are you product driven? Or I don't know their exact lingo, but mm -hmm. what are your top go to, go to market motions that are really kind of, uh, putting food on the table? Um, it's a really good question. I would say it really depends. So as I mentioned, we have so many different um, acquisitions kind of products that it really depends on kind of the business line. Some are event driven, um, some are more demand gen uh, driven, but I would say that that's kind of the one thing as CMO that I've had that I've had to realize and that, you know, we're not like a, we're not selling a singular product. We're not selling to a singular persona. So I've essentially had to adopt different GTM motions across each one of those business lines that's going to be effective in how they're going to sell. So we sell to the government. That's a really different sales motion than selling advocacy to associations. Right. And so we look across, I, I, my, job, my job is to enable each one of those that we develop a strategy for each line of business to make sure that it matches what the customers want. So varied go-to-market motions basically for the different businesses, which makes sense. Um, but it also, I'm sure it makes it really challenging to focus, right? Like we were talking earlier. I mean, that, I think that if, if there's a game of marketing, I think focus is, you know, probably the, uh, the cheat code. Okay. Focus. And I would say simplification. Yeah. So it, I think, um, what I've noticed in a lot of marketers is that things just get so complicated. And I'm like, again, it goes back to the customer. This is just really confusing. It's really complicated. Like it simple is hard. Focus is really, really hard. And so I think if you can, if you can do both and just take a step back and look at that, it, it's going to help your marketing overall. Yeah. So if we, if we double click into your CMO hat, uh, it sounds like a lot of things are going really well. I mean, I know that you guys are growing fast. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing or what's keeping you up at night in that CMO role? I think kind of mentioning like all the different you kind know, of businesses and personas. I think the focus is hard. I think um um you know we we had a really um busy couple of years so we acquired a lot of companies and then we went public. And so you can imagine what comes with that is, you know, more pressure. Um yeah. uh you know bringing all these kind of disparate businesses. They're not really disparate, but you know, there, there's different business types that you have to bring in and figure out what are you going to um, bring together? What are you going to keep separate? And overall, I think they, they all make a lot of sense. And so part of my job as marketer, as the CMO, is to figure out how do we build that narrative together? How do we how do we impact that? So I, I think that that just, I wouldn't say that keeps me up at night, but it's going back to the game. It's a really hard game. There are a lot yeah. of, pe there are a lot of levers, there are a lot of pieces, and then figuring out how do we, how do we win it? Um, is challenging, but I do think that we we recognize the need to do that, right? The need to focus, the need to kind of bring that together, and it's just going to be an, an evolution for us. Yeah, it was like a crossword puzzle before. Now it became yeah. like chess. Yeah, it is, and it's um, it's fun though at the same time. And so people are like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a lot. I really like it. I think it's really fun to think through all these problems. And so, uh, what was the nature of the acquisitions? Was it sort of like buying other companies that do something very similar where you just basically got their tech and their clients or was it like like complementary and very uh you know distinct businesses they they were across the board so um we acquired a company called curate um, a couple of years ago and it's the local tracking solution so allowed us to go deeper in the local tracking area. So that made a lot that, you know, fit nicely with the local tracking that we were offering. Um, we acquired a, an ESG technology because we knew if you think about, you know, regulation, uncertainty, ESG is one of one of the places that we wanted to go. Um, we acquired a community. So that's kind of complement complementary to the business. So those, to those sure. first two, you just built into the main platform. Right. Kind of like, well, yeah, we're kind of, kind of bringing, bringing those together. So I think they were, they, like, if you look at them on paper, you may think, 
wow, those are really different. But if you think about the fact that we're an intelligence company focused on political, regulatory, and corporate risk, then you see how they make sense together um, across time. Because at the end of the day, if it's an emerging issue and it's a challenge, we want to be able to service it and deliver you deliver those insights and that intelligence so that companies can act on it. Yeah. And I remember when I met you a long time ago, I was surprised that you guys owned CQ, which mm-hmm. is Congressional Quarterly, the political publication. Um, and now it looks like you've added roll call to that. Uh, what's what's the idea there? Why? Because that seems it just seems like. Um, but you had owned that even before the acquisition spree. So I'm curious about like what the thesis was there, or how that, how you kind of like how that goes into your product mix, basically. Yeah. So um, I think that one was in 2017. If I want to, um, if I remember correctly, I wasn't there at the time. However. Um, my understanding was we needed kind of like content around the platform. And then the so CQ and roll call uh, kind of supported like that content mix. So we were just the technology side of it. And so we knew that we wanted the content and the data. We, we also knew that, we, that CQ had a great brand and great relationships. And so it was a great way to bring both of those things together. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think it's brilliant because like there's a lot of marketers that are like, think like a media company, think like a publishing company, like put out a lot of content. And you guys were just like, or we could just buy that yeah. media company. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great brand. It's been around, I think we're celebrating what 70, I can't remember 65 or 67 and 77 years, I believe of roll call and CQ. So very old, very trusted brands. And that's, that's a challenge as a marketer I have also is we've had unknown brand acquiring more well-known brands. Um, so we acquired Voter Voice, which is the number one digital advocacy p- platform, very well known in the market, right? Fiscal Note acquired that. So usually you have the opposite situation. Yeah. So if as a marketer, that's been a huge challenge for me is, you know, what brands do we want to maintain? What, you know, what brands do we maybe want to sunset across time? So that's, and brands are expensive, but then they also come with, um, with brand value. And so we have to kind of weigh the options on both sides but it's 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 the it's unusual for that to happen because i think fiscal net was 75 people and they acquired cq which was like 300 people and cq was this editorial company like what is this technology company acquiring us um and so there were a lot of um cultural changes that happened as well i do think that at the end of the day what fiscal has done really well is we find companies that have similar values you value the customer, you create good products, um, solid products. And so when you bring those together, it's easier to get through some of these other cultural differences. Yeah. Now you'd mentioned uh, having gone public and that there was more pressure. I'm curious about how that manifests in a day-to-day. Can you add a little color to that? Like what's it like being mm-hmm. public now? What's changed? Yeah. I think... Um, as you saw with a lot of companies at the time, it was just growth, 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 right? And um, being a public company, it just means, you know, they're looking at different things nowadays. And you have to have, you know, you're, you're, you have to have that short-term view that you might not have had in the past. And so, you know, making mm-hmm. sure, right? obviously, you're quarterly, you're, you're hitting your quarterly targets. So when you're not public, you can maybe have a, run a longer game. Right. Um, so I think that that pressure has changed. I've worked at public companies before, so it wasn't surprising. Um, but it's just, it's it's different. It's it's a different type of work. It's a different mentality. And so then, you know, you, you, the game has changed, right? We have new rules that we have to play by. And so now yeah. we have to really think about, you know, operating differently as an organization. I think overall, it's a good thing, right? Having these pressures because it allows you to be become a stronger company. Um, yeah. It's stressful, right? It, it just is. It's a new set of pressures and I'm still adapting to some of these things, right? It took me, you know, I haven't been in this type of a role before in a pub- publicly traded company. So I'm still learning. I, I knew how to talk to investors before. Now it's kind of a different audience for me. So um, it's just coming with learning for me as well. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And, um, and the public, the public markets can be harsh. Like I've seen, um, we had the CMO of Zoom Info on the pod not long ago. Uh, and shortly after he was on the pod, they had a quarter which like they they hit their number actually. Um, and it was a really good quarter, but they guided a little bit conservatively. 
and lost 20%. Like their shares went wow. down by 20% in one day because of like soft guidance. It's like, yeah. what? Yeah. I'm still trying to get my arms around that whole kind of process, but um, it's a yeah, moody it's just, market. It is. It's a moody market. It's, you know, it's, there's, there's economic headwinds. It's a moody market. It's um kind of strange, strange times, but um it's, you know, it's, it's a good learning environment. I mean, I, I mentioned before I, I graduated during two recessions. So I've always like had to fight a little bit harder and yeah. to learn a little bit more quickly. So for me, this is just like another learning opportunity. Yep. It's another game. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. Um, well, time is getting away from me. I'm having so much fun that the time is just flying. So I have one more thing on fiscal note and then we'll do the lightning round. Sure. So on fiscal note, I'm curious, uh, looking forward, like looking into Q4 and next year, what are you guys investing in? Are there any, any, uh, specific plans or initiatives, anything cool you're doing with AI that you can share? Yeah. Those, that was actually, um, so I think we're, we're bringing some new products to market, which are really exciting. Um, which, um, which if you kind of go onto our press room, you can see what we're bringing out. Uh, I think interestingly, AI has always been a part of our product. So it's not a new thing for us. It's always been built in. I think what I'm excited about is continuing to lead the market there, um, and building kind of AI into our products. Um, so I think we've, we have a lot to look forward to, um, not only from a kind of an AI standpoint, but just the market needs us now more than ever. And so I'm excited to enhance our products and then kind of bring some new products to market, which I think is going to be exciting, um, moving forward. Are you able to talk about any of those, any of the new products or that's still under wraps? Kind of still under wraps or some kind of newer announcements, but, um, yeah, I think it'll be exciting. Cool. I'll check out your press page for sure. All right. Well. Crystal, this has been awesome. You are super impressive. Even I'm even more impressed with you now than I was uh, before. You well, got that. You. you got that left right brain thinking, and I and I love the idea of being the shapeshifter as a marketer and and thinking of marketing and even the world as just like one big game. That's that's a powerful. Yeah. That's a powerful Thank you. Uh, frame. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, lightning round. Are you ready? I'm ready. Question number one. If you were to start a side hustle, what side hustle would that be? Oh, gosh. Um, it would probably be something around, um, oh, gosh, um, like healthcare. Um, so I, I had an opportunity when I was in grad school to work for a company called Scotia Foundation. And they basically provided reading glasses to kind of the, the bottom kind of 1% of the population. So I always have this like altruistic um, tendency. So, I, and actually, the executive director is now the CEO founder of Warby Parker. So, guy who like really understood, you know, how do you how do you um, give back, but then also kind of create a, a product. And so, I would probably do something around like healthcare, doing something around like the Scojo Foundation again. Interesting. All right. Cool. Uh, question number two is top three books or authors or influencers that have made an impact on your career. Oh gosh. Um, I like, I like business books, but I spend a lot of time reading classics. I love, um, um, so I, I, I would probably say my favorite books, um, ever are probably East of Eden. Um, I love the Count of Monte Cristo and what is my third favorite book? Um, I love, um, Silas Marner. I know that these are just random classics, but I always go back to the classics as being just really solid stories. And, um, I love reading them. Cool. And then question number three is how do you avoid burnout and how do you help your team to avoid burnout? Um, that's a great question. Um, I encourage mental health vacations. So at the beginning of the summer, I said, you should take a vacation. When is your vacation plan? I take vacation and I, I don't check email. So I encourage anyone who's a CMO, your job, you're important. You're not that important. Really decompress, turn off. Um, allow yourself to do that and allow your team to do that as well. Lead by example. I was yeah. out last week. I didn't, I barely checked email. Um, I think nice. I got one slack and I think that's really important to be able to set boundaries in your life, to be able to get that, that space, that refresh. Nice. I love it. Cool folks. Well, uh, everybody that's listening, if you learned something here today, or if you laughed a little bit, give us a like, tell tell a friend about the show or give us a five-star rating. It really helps us out. 
Uh, Crystal, for folks that want to learn more about you and or Fiscal Note, uh, how, where would you direct them? Um, you can either go to my LinkedIn profile, Crystal Putman Garcia, or um, FiscalNote.com. Nice. Love it. All right. We'll stay on the line just one second, sure. Crystal. But that was another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO, and we will see you next time. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us here today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at RevenueDrivenCMO.com. That's RevenueDrivenCMO.com. And hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization, if you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, web mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. And that's just because you're a listener of this podcast. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it. Literally zero downside, unlimited potential for growth. So do yourself a favor, revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, no hyphens, no punctuations. You will be happy about that decision.